who knows that in the last couple weeks, we had a little bit of a unexpected visitor here at Deeper Life Assembly. Were you guys aware? One of the many days that our brother Elisha, our jack of all trades, was here working in the sanctuary, a snake from God knows where crawled its way right into the very house of the Lord. When I thought of this, I'm like, oh my goodness, we... <laughs> Don't steal my thunder, Pastor. We're going to get to that part soon. <laughs> But you know what, Pastor, despite the size, I know these are Caribbean people. They're going to done did lose their mind when they see their screecher, right? So what do you think? How would you have reacted if you were here in the seats and, you, oh, some would run, some would scream, jump on the seat? You know, many of us, many of us, we would avoid the situation, right? Because, because we're scared. This was a bit of a surprise. We are unprepared to deal with that particular circumstances. If it was me, sometimes we also, when we see the little snake crawl into our lives, we accommodate. You know, uh, Elisha said, oh, the snake is dangerous. We have to do something. I'm like, no, brother. It's so small. It's so cute. Just, just grab it and take it outside. You see, I'm trying to be gentle. I'm trying to negotiate with the snake and find a win-win situation with the snake. How many of us are like that too? You know, we, we minimize the situation. We're trying to be diplomatic. Just keep the peace. Don't make a big deal. I'm like that as well. Brother Elisha, when he saw this little threat of a thing, he immediately, he did not avoid the problem. He did not accommodate the problem. He immediately arrested the problem. He grabbed this little snake, and well, I don't want to give the description, you'll see a photo later, and quickly had him meet his maker outside. Now, I was thinking, this boy was far too rough on this tiny little thing. It's, it's so small. It's, it's so harmless. What is, what is the big deal? But then Elisha said something to me that has stayed with me ever since. He said, but Nil, but that snake would get bigger and then it'll come back and it will bite the children. Huh. There is some truth in the way he thought about this particular situation. You know, oftentimes in our own lives, we see just little issues here or there that are not a big deal. They're, they're no danger to us. They're very minimal because we're strong and we're mighty in the Lord. We're big enough to handle it. But there's two things we sometimes forget. Number one, unaddressed problems, even wrong thinking that you may never see or speak about, always has a habit to grow. In fact, not just in the natural does the situation grow, but the word tells us in the spiritual, even if you cast out a demon and you clean up the house and you don't put anything inside of that place, it'll come back with seven more and now you're worse off than you were before. So number one, the little snakes have a tendency to grow. But then number two, we are not the sole inheritors. We are not the only ones to bear witness to the situations and the way we handle them in our lives. In fact, everything we say and do leaves a lingering effect for those who come after us. And we have to be conscientious of the downstream effect, the, the lingering consequences, or even more subtle, the precedent that it might establish in your household. Let me give you a little illustration. A couple years ago, when I was a youth pastor, the young men and women that came around me, they, praise God, they had a strong sense of justice, of how they wanted their youth group to be handled and how they wished things were handled in the church. They would often tell me all the time that they so badly didn't want to gossip or tear each other down or, or be an enemy to each other when situations were to arise. 
I appreciated the intention behind what they said. But I also observed that when problems did arise, they often behaved exactly as they said they never wanted to do. And the thing is, I know that they agreed with what they said because the way they spoke came from their heart. But the thing is, when a, a circumstance arises that feels beyond your capacity, or when you're young and you don't quite have the emotional maturity to resolve that situation, you default to what your experience and your observations have shown you in the past. This is something every human does. So my title today is, next slide for me, The Generations. You see, I have my little theme, reaching the nations through the generations, and here's what I mean by that. We often think of building the kingdom in terms of breath, but not in depth. We look at the kingdom as, oh, Judea, Samaria, all the world that's here and now, just getting farther and wider. But in reality, the kingdom is also yesterday, today, and tomorrow. For the 2,000 years since Jesus Christ has walked the earth, we look at our population as, oh, 7 billion people. But there has been 37 billion people that have walked the earth since that particular period of time. You see how the scope is much wider when you pull that extra dimension of time. So we also must be cognizant of how we are setting ourselves up for a legacy of righteousness. Amen. I feel, next slide for me, that the best way that we all can do that is when we have biblical examples or even the little everyday situations that come and, and irk us and we think it's just an inconvenience, these are actually blessings from God because it gives us an opportunity to draw out lessons and applications from yesterday so we can release that knowledge into today. Oftentimes that release is predicated on knowing how to unbind the, the way that we were thinking, the, the mentality, some of the shackles, some of the generational cur curses and natural struggles that we've had that keep us bound today. So that when we are planting seeds, we're thinking of tomorrow. There's a song that I love. I make, uh, uh, Rebecca and I play it on the way home when we uh, take, when I drop the girls off. And it goes, I'll just sing a little bit for you. Forgive me, I, I don't know what key it's supposed to be in. Uh, remind me of this with every decision. Generations will reap what I sow. I could pass on a curse or a blessing to those I will never know. The song. <laughs> The song goes on to describe how sometimes what your great, great, great grandmother has done has led you up for success or pain. And as a reminder that even the things that we do, our children, our grandchildren, our great grands, those we will never see, those we may never know, will eat the fruit of our choices. So join me on this little journey. And all that, that's half my sermon right there. <laughs> So let's see how well we're doing. Next slide for me, sir. So I'm going to tell you a story about a, a crooked crown. You could say the story of Abimelech is a tale of a rock, a thorn bush, and a simple betrayal that led to a cataclysm of circumstances that ended in tragedy. In Judges 9, you can read the whole story, but I'm going to give you, I'm just going to help paint the picture for you a little, little bit. Abimelech was one of the many sons of Gideon. Gideon had 70 sons, although there was something special about this one. His mother was from the town of Sechem. And when he realized that he would not be able to participate in the glory and the inheritance of these other 70 brothers, he concocted a little plan. He was going to go to his mother's clan and have a little chat with his uncles and say, huh, if you had to choose, have those 70 other men in Gilead to rule over you who don't even know anything about us and our ways in this city, or just me, 
a brother like you, who would you choose? The people of Session, very keen on their own self-interest, decided hmm, what Abimelech says sounds pretty good to me. They gathered up some 70 shekels, which is quite a sum of money. It was enough for him to hire a band of rowdy, reckless men, mercenaries, who in their nonsense and chaos went back to the town of Gilead and on one rock slaughtered each and every son of Gideon. The same Gideon that delivered all of Israel from the Midianites. And you know what's crazy? No one said anything. No one said anything. After Abimelech does this, his rowdy bunch and all of Session think, oh, well, we're in smooth sailings. They crown this fool as king. They crown him as, as king and the youngest son, so I guess they killed 69 of the boys, uh, who escaped pronounces a curse on them. He uh, uh, likens Abimelech to a thorn bush, the least of all the trees who for their own convenience has gone down to the very rung, picked up the dregs, made him king, and the son says, if you have done right by Gideon's house, then you know, live in peace with your new warlord boss over here. But if you have treated us uh, with contempt and evil, then let the Lord allow a fire from that thorn bush to eat up all of these people. I'm going to abbreviate it. Long story short, an evil spirit of contention was sprouted up between Abimelech and his very same financial patrons, the, the Sechemites. And one thing led to another, a conflict here, some rowdy words when you were drunk and you should watch out what you say because someone's always listening, but we'll get around to that later. Uh, after all of this chaos, Abimelech takes his men and ransacks that very same city. He not only drives out the rebels, but he takes it upon himself to when the women and the children and the people that are just the inhabitants of that city run to their strong tower for safety, he lights this thing on fire and kills every single one. In fact, he goes to another city, tries to do another thing to another set of women and children and men that were not a part of this generational chaos and tries to light their strong city on fire. But luckily, there was a sassy lady who looked down, saw the bug beneath her, popped off a stone, fell right on the man's head. And in that strange turn of events, that is how the Lord avenged the wrongs done, and cleaned up both the wickedness of Sechem and the wickedness of Abimelech's house. Now, this is the kind of thing y'all can hear in a telenovela, right? You, you can't make this up. <laughs> but if you really think about it, this story started long before Abimelech. You see, this story started with Gideon. So let's look back a little bit. Give me the next slide. And we're going to look at the ways where this situation, uh, forward for me, uh, could have, where we avoided, where we accommodated, and where God now had to intervene and arrest. You see, Abimelech, remember I said he was a son of Gideon? He was kind of a son of Gideon. He actually, and Gideon had many wives. This man had many wives, yet he still took it upon himself to also have concubines. You see, it's the area where you lack self-control. When you open that door for yourself, you have opened that same door for anyone else. And now they can intervene and influence your situation. So it is where you prostitute yourself is where you're also implanting a snare. Now, I know none of us are prostitutes, currently seeing prostitutes. I know these are strong words. Please be gentle with me. They illustrate a bigger concept that we can apply to the little things. You know, maybe we're just prostituting ourselves with the way that we dress when we want to get a little extra attention or we think it'll give us a financial advantage where we are. Or maybe we prostitute ourselves with the types of morals or 
the morals that we say we believe in, that we know is against the Lord, but we think it's easier than to have any trouble or to have a discussion. There's little, little avoidances that we do every day. What I think is very interesting is that this concubine, if you read on, it says that she was a slave girl, but she was from Sechem. Now see, what I was thinking about is Gilead and Sechem, they might have some conflict between themselves, but they're all part of the house of Israel. And long ago in Leviticus, uh, when the Lord made allowances for some of the foolishness that we did, he was very specific. Like, oh, if uh, a foreigner lends money from you, you can add interest. But you don't charge usury to your own brothers and sisters. You are not supposed to go capture and enslave your own brothers and sisters. So if this woman was a woman of Sechem, that means that she was also an Israelite. Why was she a slave girl that he was yanking around to begin with? And I know that God did make some accommodation for some of the way things were then. He said if you were in debt and you sold yourself into slavery, uh, so this is something that Israelites could have done, but they were given a period of time to redeem themselves. And even if they couldn't afford to redeem themselves, once a cycle in the year of Jubilee, these people were released back to their hometown. Yet this girl was still a slave girl and a concubine, it seems like, for all of her life, long enough for her child to grow up and have this, this rebellion. So what I also realized is that where you compromise your standard is the very same place where you've compromised your own security. Because this situation really should have never happened to begin with. But he's probably not thinking when he sees this cute little 16-year-old, however old she was, that, oh, you know, 40 years from now, she's going to have a kid, and this kid is going to slaughter each and every other descendants of my line. You see, but you have to think generationally. You have to think in decades, y'all, and not just minutes. Next slide for me. So where do we sometimes avoid dealing with the little sins? I think we're pretty good. Like, we're not out there seeing wildly unrighteous things, and we're not out there saying all these evil and unjust things. Well, maybe a little, right? We can be a little feisty if we don't need to be. But sometimes saying nothing is the loudest thing you could ever say, right? We have to be conscientious of things. In the New Testament, Jesus often akins, he says that if, and I'm paraphrasing, that if you see a thief and you say nothing and you do nothing, then you too are like him. So if you and your friends are at, at, at uh, uh, Auntie Elaine's house and you break a little vase and you think it's okay just to turn the crack around and no one see that it's no big deal, we are avoiding the little snakes. Or if, you know, the poor church has barely enough little income and they, they buy some beautiful little flowers and some, and some little decorations and all these ladies are devoting their time and their precious items so we can have a sense of honor and you slip in one of those little dowlies or that little lace thing in your pocket, are we not also entertaining a little snake and hurting our own, our own house, our own people? So there's a parallel here. I'm not going to go too far into it because <laughs> I'm worried about time. But we often say moral decline. Oh, generation is getting worse after worse after worse. But what we consider moral decline is actually cultural drift. Let me explain to you the difference. When y'all were young, you had a mama that would spank your behind if you did not say the right thing, did not dress properly, had a certain standard for you. Now, whether you liked or disliked that standard, I am sure 40 years later, each and every one of you are proud of the young men or young women you have become, right? Now, here's the thing. If you are proud of the way you have turned out and you know that your parents tethered you here, if you tether your next generation to any point other than here, you will get different results. Here's what I mean. You could say, oh, well, I knew that I sometimes smoke and drank and curse and did all these things, and I, I turned out all right. And that may be true. You did turn out, turn out okay. But when you make the new standard, not no, honey, don't do this, and you 
give room for your own drift and you make the standard where you left off and not where you began, no child is perfect. They're not going to perfectly now hold to your uh, new version or your updated version of these rules and standards. They find their own creative twist in <laughs> how to break the rule, the gentler rule that you already gave them grace and wiggle room in. So they take it another couple inches. And then when they have babies, you're like, well, you know what? I slept around and I had tattoos and earrings and I did that and I was okay and they give another couple inches. And then those child, yes, I had a couple husbands, and I, and I killed a few people, and it wasn't a big deal, and I turned up okay, and on and on it goes. Because if you're not tethered to a standard that is immovable, you're going to float away. Not you, but what we represent, our line, the generations, they will float away. And I think there is a human and a good-hearted explanation to this. Think of a King David. When he had fallen into adultery, he was repentant. But the shame, the shame of that sin stayed not on his shoulders, but even in the back of his mind. So when he noticed his oldest son had developed this unnatural lust for his own sister, he, he didn't say anything, probably because he knows, well, I did worse. He's a good boy. It won't be so bad. But the thing is, when you tether a little lower, now the son took it upon himself to violently attack, violate, and then throw away that child, his own half-sister. And the drift actually continued even more in that same generation. You see, when Tamar, in her brokenness, left the palace and stayed in her brother Absalom's house, her full brother, for two years, her brother Absalom saw her degraded condition, her, her, her anger, her rejection, what has happened to her. And that bitterness springed a well of hatred in his heart. And then he murdered that very same man. And the father still didn't say anything because like, well, you know, I murdered someone once too. I, what can I say? I understand what he did. I should have said something. He was quiet again. He didn't even come and comfort the boy or officially absolve him of his sin or punishment. He did nothing. So then now this boy who doesn't know where he stands with his father rebels even farther. We didn't even have to look at multiple generations here. We saw how adultery degraded to rape, degraded to murder, degraded to treason. And that happened in one generation. So the thing is, here's what the devil likes to do. He likes to wrap you so much in the guilt of your own failings that he's trying to blind you to the fact that you are actually in the perfect position to give guidance and insight in that situation. If David pulled his oldest son and said, son, there have been times where I was led astray by the desires of my own heart. And I had to learn the hard way that you cannot believe your feelings or be guided from them. How much better would this young man's story would have been if David, rather than hiding his fault, was honest before his children, used it as a launching pad. In the same way, where you have done well, your strengths, they are the perfect place to inform your children, this is what I've done and it's worked. But guess what? As you go on your life, your weaknesses, your failings, your mistakes, they are also the perfect place where you can come in and be honest and guide your children. God can redeem them both. Don't be fooled that you cannot say something just because you struggled with it. That is a trick. Just like even the apple, it's a trick. All right, next one. All right. Well, all right. So... There's ways that we can avoid things when we know it is not right in our heart. We turn a blind eye, opens the door to future mischief. But think of the ways also in this story that our people accommodated sin. Don't you think Sechem knew that Abimelech was not the rightful king, not the rightful heir? But you see, they have their own little agenda and thought it would give them an advantage. They accommodated because they were motivated by self-interest. You know what I think is so funny? You know where they got the money that they gave to Abimelech to go and hire those murderers? 
from one of their very temples of Baal. It says they took the silver from one of the Baal temples and they gave it to Abimelech. So the things that you devote not unto God, but unto idols, that also is a snare to us. So think of all the times where, oh, I made a $500 pledge and I could either spend $250 on this new equipment I decide I need, or I can sacrifice that amount and give it to my pledge. Can I tell a little story? Am, am I allowed? Okay. There was a particular time, my parents made a pledge for $1,000 a couple years back. Now, the money never came. They were struggling, like, oh, we're so sorry. We're in this bad situation. Can you absolve us from this at the time? Now, later, when we were trying to buy a home for this new construction, there was a company that would buy, give us this lot or secure it with a $1,000 deposit. When we had, when we needed this home and we were still in this desperate situation and we didn't know where to go, we somehow was able to pull together the funds for the $1,000 deposit. But here is the thing. When you plant your seed on any ground but God's ground, and we talked about this and they, and that's a part of a testimony, so don't you, don't, not exposing anything here. That very same company that took our $1,000 turned out to be shady in a lot of different ways. So we ended up losing that $1,000 that we just told the Lord a couple months back that we didn't have to give. Now we have no thousand, no pledge, and no house, right? That is what we do. We pray for something, and when we get it, we conveniently say, oh, well, I don't have it for the Lord. Let me give it to Baal, or whoever, whoever is Baal. Whoever it could be. Do you know who Baal is? Anyone but Jesus, right? Because... And here's a lesson that we, that we love to talk about this. If you are hungry and all you have in your hand is a little bit of seed, but you realize that this little bit of seed is not enough to fill your belly, that handful of seed was not meant for you to eat. It was meant for you to plant. So my parents, they, when they saw this and looked back and saw like, whew, what a ridiculous situation. Next time we have a little bit of seed, however small or meaningless we think it is, don't eat it, plant it. Because when you plant it in the house of God, he is faithful to let it spring up and cover your needs, amen? So that is a way that we can avoid us accommodating by self-interest, being cautious not to devote our resources to idle purposes. But remember how I said in the time of, of uh, the rock and the killing of the 70 boys, how all of Israelites said, all the Israelites said nothing? There are times that we accommodate by withholding either the rightful blessing, the rightful justice, the rightful kindness, or even just remembering how the house of Gideon had been good to them. Are there times that we're harsh on someone who may be doing something wrong today, but we're forgetting how good they were to us when we were a teenager, when we were out and about, when, when we were down and they picked us up, but now we're doing okay and we forget. Or now we're, we're pressured in many other ways, and so we act out on the one who we think is the source of the issue. We can withhold justice. So I wanna give another example. Pastor, don't get mad at me. I think this is a good example. Next slide for me. All right. Last week, our poor pastor had to sit up here and, and beg us for a little bit of offering, for a little bit of this so we can keep the water on and so we can keep the lights on. He's talking about offering, but what we know from our instruction that we're supposed to be giving our full tithe. Tithe is Hebrew for 10%. That little bit of offering, that $10, $5, $20 we toss in, is that really our tithe? The thing that we were instructed to bring into the storehouse so they can be bred in the Father's house? And you might say, well, sis, I don't believe in the tithe. Yes, you do. You do. I'm about to prove it to you. I'll prove it to you. Every last one of us believe that a 10% tithe is little, and in fact, we should do more. I'll prove it to you. Last week, it was last week, right, Pastor? Pastor did this beautiful sermon about the 10 lepers 
who were uh, in their sickness and desperation called out to Jesus. Jesus gave them instruction to go show yourself to the priest, and they were healed. And of those 10 men, only one came back unto the Lord. And when he came back to Jesus praising and praising and praising, didn't we all say, huh, what a, what a puny representation of gratitude, right? When one out of 10 lepers come, it is so small. When a tithe of lepers come to give honor and praise to Jesus Christ for when he healed all 100%, we say it is so small. But when a tithe of our money is expected of us, oh, oh, it is so large. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> we know that all 10 were cleansed. We know that all 10 should have given their praises to the Lord. So when you are a child of God, don't you expect the Lord to put his blessing on all 100% of your money? Don't we expect him to, to rebuke the devourer from all 100% of your money? Well, my goodness, if our bank accounts were lepers, not even one came back, just a foot, maybe just a toe, and we want to be patted on the back for that. Are we not withholding from the house of God? Are we not accommodating a little bit of self-interest? Are we not taking the rest of that tithe and buying tacos and buying hair products and buying whatever it is Bayal says is really cute and in style this week? Right? Right? What are we doing? You have to think about it. All right. Something pastor said once is uh, the Lord told him that if he builds his house, uh, the Lord's house, that the Lord will build his house. Now, that was a promise given to pastor. But as one of the sheep of Pastor Amar, I think that also very much applies to all of us. Right? If we build the Lord's house, he will build our house. Amen. So I feel like maybe, Pastor, I'm at, I'm at my 20. So I, if you guys want, I can give you notes for the other future, or we can slide through real, real quick. How much time do I have? Give me an exact minute. OK. Well, in three minutes, let's see what we can do. I'm not going to talk about all the ways that God was forced to arrest the situation. Just know, I may have a little joke there. Go ahead and read it. You'll see about a man named Gaal who said and did the same nonsense that Abimelech did to stir up the people, this time against him. And that reminds me, something girls would say in school, you know, if he cheats with you, he'll cheat on you. So there is always another Gaal in your situation. So when you cause trouble for one, there will be someone else coming and causing that same trouble for you. But we're not going to talk about that. Let's skip to, the, skip to the last bit. Something I want to talk about is how can we arrest the progress and path of the snake so God does not have to arrest it for us? One of them is obvious. We know 2 Chronicles 7.14, you can go ahead and go to the next slide, says that if my people who are called by their na my name will humble themselves, Essentially, we know that if we turn back to the Lord, we repent and we let go of whatever little snake accommodation, little avoidance that we're doing, God will heal us. But there's one other method that I think is perfect for our house. Next slide. In John chapter 20, verse 23, is a verse that often goes unnoticed. Next slide. Whoever sins, ye remit they are remitted unto them. And whoever sins ye retain, they are retained. In other versions, it says, whoever sins you forgive is forgiven them. And if you retain them, it is retained against them. Last slide for me. So repenting means to turn yourself. But remitting means, just as Jesus Christ said, oh, take up your mat and walk, or to the man coming through the ceiling, your sins are forgiven, he has given us the power also to release 
our brothers from the debts, the sins, the offenses, the angers, and little trifling bitternesses we hold against them. And of course, we know that self-interest, if you do not forgive others, you will not be forgiven. But guys, it's bigger than that. When we do not remit our brother's sins, but instead we retain them, don't you know that we are all in the same body? So when you are retaining sins from your same body, don't you know you're just posting debts up against the same joint account that we all share here as Deeper Life Assembly? And then we wonder why the coffers are getting low. We are charging each other, each other, each other, each other, and we're pulling the same money that we need to feed us. You see, that is one of the ties, one of the traps of the snake. So I know that there are times that your brother and sister may not repent in front of your eyes, but when you release, when you forgive, when you remit those sins, you create the condition of freedom, of liberation, where God can now again restore the provision and insight that he has for this house. So that is the commitment I want from each and every one of us today. Last slide. So when you see your snake, you don't even think of entertaining it so it can come and bite the children. You arrest the situation. If it is something you have done, and it's never a 100%, 0% situation, there's always a little bit of hands in everything. You repent from your part, and you remit the other's part. And that is how you discard the serpent. Thank you very much. Hallelujah. Give him praise. So, you heard the word. You heard a clean, clear word. You heard a word with instructions. Now, how are we going to respond to that word? If you want this young pastor to pray for you, kindly stand to your feet. She will pray with you how to deal with these issues. If you need that prayer, go ahead and stand. Please. Now you say, we all in some way, whether we recognize it or not, have a need. We yes. all can do a little house. We have issues, we have needs. All I want you to know yes. is to season this word with a prayer. Amen. You pray for them. Amen. Yes, sir. Oh Lord God, Heavenly Father, thank you for the way you make all things clear and all things new for your people, Lord. We come to you, Deeper Life Assembly, as a house that loves you and has kept you as king over our fellowship, Lord. But we know there are places where maybe we have been silent at the wrong time or harsh at the wrong time, Lord. Forgive us, whether in our communal life, our career life, our personal life, Father, where we have been used by the enemy. But Lord God, where there are places where there is brokenness and where there is pain, we ask right now that your Holy Spirit will meet each and every one of us. Break the chains, the lies, the twists of truth from the enemy and bring in a flood of revelation, how to handle our conflicts, how to be transparent before the Lord our God, and how to be loving for the fellow sheep, even some of them goats, here in the house of the Lord, because we know Jesus Christ died for all, therefore all are able to be saved. Lord, if there's anyone uh, in the house today who has not yet made that full commitment to open their heart to the Lord, to let the Spirit of God seek and search it and take out any unclean thing and remake any broken thing, Lord God, I hope that they will feel you tugging on the edge of their hearts, God, and that they will hear Jesus' knock and they will open up to him. 
And if that's you, we're all going to repeat it. But in your heart, say it with all of your mind, your spirit, your soul. Lord God, Lord Jesus Christ, I know I am a sinner. I know that I cannot perfect my way or know my way myself. Oh, Lord Jesus, thank you for dying for my sins. Lord God, open up the way before me, how I can walk with clean hands and a pure heart before you. And let your Holy Spirit comfort and guide me through every situation because I want to be and I now receive and recognize that I am your child. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. One more time, give her a round of applause and appreciation. God bless you. We love you. Appreciate you so much.